Hey folks, Ariel over here. Behind this, we are going to wash some of this great big bucket of service berries we picked. Um, there's a little too many to wash comfortably all at once. So we're under the lean to beside the shop if you're wondering. The temperature is reading about 98 degrees in here, which is about 50 degrees too hot for this time of year. But it is what it is. Anyway, the easiest way to wash most kinds of wild berries that I have ever picked, um, because if you are picking rapidly while the mosquitoes bite you, um, you tend to get definitely some of this stuff. Loose leaves fall in, little clusters, etc. And I would rather stand here in the shade and pick them out while not being eaten by bugs. I guess I need my compost bucket. Um, you can pick them out, but the easiest way to wash most different kinds of wild berries, I do this when I pick choke cherries, currants, all kinds of things, is in general, this may be a little hard to see here, but the really good ones will sink in water. If I can get down underneath and get a, a, you know, a handful of just them, those are the really good ones. Now, berries that have some kind of bug damage will usually float. Berries that are underripe will usually float. And berries that, the reason I have so many floaters here, berries that are starting to dehydrate a bit will also float. Um, they, you know, we could have been picking a little earlier as far as the ripeness of the berries went and we weren't. So some of them are starting to dry up a little bit. For making juice, which I want to do, that is just fine, so it's not a big deal. But if we'd pick these at the perfect ripeness, basically I would be able to just go through here and skim off everything that was floating and put it in the compost or let the, the birds eat it, whatever. Um, this, because I've got some halfway dehydrating ones that I still want to use, is going to make this just a a little bit more time consuming, but this is a trick that works for just about any kind of berry. Um, the lean-to area here, you can see the wood pile in the background, is ultimately mostly wood storage, but this front end of it has been doubling all summer as kind of a porch and a canning kitchen as well. Um, growing up, my parents always had, look at how beautiful those berries are, rich, rich blue, and if there's a couple stems still on them, I don't care particularly much. Um, but look at these up close. So again, you can see I got a lot of floaters. And if I just, you know, do this, it, it helps knock any loose leaves and such. And you can pick all this stuff out while you're picking, but you will be out there picking a lot more. And like I said, it's easier for me to do standing here and just pick a little faster. But if I skim away the, the top floaties and get what's down in here, you see how those are all basically perfect looking berries? They're going in my, my clean bin. And the occasional stem. Now, unripe berries, and it's fine to have a few of these for um, making juice, but see how these guys look red as compared to, or pinky as compared to the blue ones? Um, those aren't quite ripe. There's a few of these, there seemed to actually be a lot this year, but I tried not to pick tons of them, that got some kind of green gall in them. I'd rather not, I'm gonna put them in the compost, I'm not gonna put them in our juice. And then we have the ones that, like I said, are starting to dehydrate just a little bit, and they're actually gonna be fine for juice, but they do make this process a little harder um, to pick through. But what I'm going to do is get the, the good ones out of here first by skimming the top stuff back. And I'm pretty much just picking out what is on the bottom. Then we'll deal with the rest. But this is how I wash berries. And it's pretty efficient. The, uh, the bigger of a bowl you have or container or whatever with more surface area, the better. Here's another one of these with whatever kind of... Uh, gall it's getting. I don't know what that is. 
but we're not putting those in our juice so probably by the time it it cooks good and high it wouldn't matter um, at a good high temperature that is but we're gonna discard those and the stems probably wouldn't hurt anything either there's nothing toxic about a service berry stem but I do try to pick the majority of them out And again, it wouldn't hurt you to eat elderberry leaves. Either, sorry, elderberry leaves are actually somewhat toxic. Service berry leaves. Now, where I have all these halfway dehydrating ones too that are trying to float on the surface, um, I'm gonna use a bunch of them. They actually look fine. I can tell, I don't know if the camera can pick it up. I can tell they're starting to dry up just a little bit and that's why they're floating. But for juice making or jam or a whole lot of things you would do that's just not a problem um you can treat when people say well what do you do with a service berry um basically anything you do with a blueberry uh, put it on top of your ice cream put it on top of your oatmeal or pancakes make jam out of it make a pie make a cobbler um, but one of our very favorite ways to enjoy these through the winter is to make juice out of them and uh, washing probably is the most time-consuming part of this, so I'm not going to let the camera run the whole time I wash this giant bucket. But um, after that, actually canning them into juice is really quick. Add some more berries into my wash water. Oh, what I was saying earlier is growing up we always had a canning kitchen. A lot of people had some kind of summer kitchen, outdoor kitchen. Uh, my parents had basically a whole second kitchen in there garage um, something that lets you keep the mess and the heat and all of that outside so this front end of the lean-to is kind of doubling as that this table I'm working on is simply some sawhorses with a scrap of plywood on top um, right over there if I remember I'll link to it down below but that's a little outdoor propane burner it's got uh, three burners on it right now I got some water coming to a boil it's great for doing large batches of anything outdoors used it to uh, make you know spaghetti sauce um, we use it to do this kind of thing we use it when we're butchering and so on it's just a, a way more efficient way to heat massive kettles and to keep heat and mess outdoors so that's nice oh and then over here behind me you can probably see that was a find I found at a secondhand store it's a like utility sink a double sink it's not plumb to anything at all but it's got um, the two nice basins and I can wash dishes in here that don't fit in the sink inside. I can, you know, just pour boiling water in another pot like this if I want and do a wash and a rinse. The drain just goes into a five gallon bucket that's sitting under there, which as long as I remember to empty it before it's overflowing, um, I just put the, the wash water into the compost. But it's, uh, it's very handy to have basically a sink and a stove and the table to work on all this stuff outdoors. Um, every now and then I have to chase the chickens out of here because I don't know why they're chickens and when you have free-ranging chickens they want to go everywhere including where you don't prefer them to be and they've got a barn and a yard and a whole tree line along the creek and three other acres they could hang out on and every now and then I've had to pull the broom out and convince them that they're not coming in here and helping me make berries juice right now. So you may see them come around the corner again and be like, hmm, maybe now we're allowed in here. Anyway, I'll be back once I am done washing berries. What I've got here is my bowl of nice clean berries. Scalding hot jars, what you just saw me doing was dipping them in boiling water, which boiled over there on the stove. And that's just to be sure they're clean after having sat around on the pantry shelves all 
for months since they were last um, used. I tried to set them upside down so they don't fill with dust, but they still do that just to be safe. If you've got a dishwasher, you can just run them through a, a hot like rinse cycle in there, um, whatever. Some people put them in a, an oven and heat them up or put them right in the canner and heat them in there. Um, I've usually done it in the sink, something like what you just saw. Anyway, this recipe, if you can call it that, works for a lot of things. Growing up, what we did this with was grapes um, to make grape juice. And you can make this more or less concentrated. You could probably do it with just about any kind of fruit or berry stem I missed. Um, and there's a great deal of flexibility. Um, this is one of the few things we'd sometimes when I was growing up do in half gallon jars because I ate so much of it. I've got some really old jars here. Some my mother gave me, some she wasn't using. Um, Anne, if you're watching, thank you for the ones you sent. I think some of them are in this batch and I've found a couple boxes at thrift stores over the years. So some of these are, the older canning jars tend to be the highest quality glass, the thickest, um, nicest, and I've got all kinds of, I've got ball and mason and the old atlas mason, and all kinds of fun ones here. I prefer whenever possible to use wide mouth canning jars rather than these regular, or I've always thought of them as narrow mouth but I have some narrow mouth and juice is a very um, good thing for that because it's it's not something that has large chunks like you know a pickle or a peach or something you want to get in and out of the jar so I tried to sort out narrow mouth jars only for this operation. Now I could make these jars completely full if I wanted then it would have a very very concentrated juice I don't want it quite that strong so what I'm doing it's filling up somewhere between a third and a half. As you can see, I'm not precisely measuring this, though you could if you wanted to. Um, but we're going to basically extract the, f the flavor of the berries into the water. You can probably see the pot back there on the stove. It's got some more water coming up to a boil. That's what we're going to pour over these in a minute. And I'm going to have more, but I'm starting with 14 jars here because I'm going to run two canners at once. Um, this is a recipe that would normally be water bathed. Um, I usually use my steam canners rather than water baths for anything that can be water bath. Steam canning and water bathing are fairly interchangeable. They're both different than pressure canning. Um, I'm going to call that good on my berry. You know, so each jar is about half full, plus it's going to, you know, be less than that because there's actually a lot of um, air space, of course, in between the berries. Now, I've, I did these one year with a recipe that was something like what we did with grape juice. I think we put like a tablespoon of sugar in per jar. Um, that was too sweet for me. I did it one year where I put no sugar in. That was just not quite sweet enough. So what I'm going to do this year is this is a heaping half a teaspoon. I'm just using this so that I have some idea of what I'm doing. And I'm just using a, you know, raw sugar here. Hopefully next year I'll be able to do this with honey from our own bees, but we have not har harvested any of that yet. This is just to add just a little sweetness because you are leaching, uh, you know, a lot of berry flavor out into a lot of water and I don't want it to get the, the sweetness of the berries to get too diluted. So the amount of sweetening could be definitely to your taste, depending on the kind of fruit you use, could be none at all. Or it could be a whole lot if you really like it sweet. So I've got 14 jars here. They're still pretty warm because that water was too boiling hot for me to touch. And what we're going to do is pour boiling water in here, put the lids on, and get them in the canner. If you've never used one of these propane burners like this before, some come with igniters. This isn't a very fancy one, so I just use this long handle. Um, lighter because that's easiest. Run up one little propane tank. I've just got a spare there because I didn't want to run out in the middle of canning. These, they come in triple, double, or single burner models usually. 
Um, this is a triple, though I'm rarely using more than two at a time because I can't really get more than two big kettles on at a time. But over here where I'm boiling water, you can see I have had it on low. That's only turned a teeny bit of the way up, and I got flames shooting out around it. I can't even imagine what you'd need to be to use from any of these burners on full bore. But they work really well. And do not use, let me, this should be clear, but you're not going to use something like this inside an enclosed house. This is under a shaded roof, but the entire sidewall there is open to the outdoors. Um, this would be way too much heat and possibly propane. This is not for inside use. This is for a well-ventilated area. We just have it sitting in the shade here. So when that water's getting warm, when it gets just hot enough that it's starting to boil, that's going to go in our jars here. And meanwhile, we're warming up one canner here, and I got my second one sitting right back there. It's going to go in this burner as soon as this kettle comes off here. But if you ever do any outdoor cooking and canning, a, uh, I can link to this one down below if I remember, but um, one like this is very handy and they're not very expensive. Plus, if you ever have um, some kind of power outage or anything, if you've got a 25 pound propane bottle like that or anything bigger, and one of these, you could do a lot of cooking outside for a long time if your indoor cooking relies on electricity. Okay. Got more hot water here. And we're gonna put second canner right back onto that burner to warm up. And down just as low as it can go. Okay, now remember I said that I had just put these in boiling water. They've cooled down just a bit, but they're still warm. If you put boiling water into cold jars, you will crack them, almost guaranteed. So don't do that. It's also a good idea to use surfaces that aren't real conductive when you're canning, like this uh, scrap of plywood table here. Uh, wood it isn't going to cause a great big um, temperature change, but even so, I still like to have a, a rag or a towel or something like that down between. It helps just a little further with slowing down the temperature change. So now on top of my berries, I am just pouring boiling water and taking that one. I got a hair full. Let me show you on one I'm actually do right. I might scoop just a little out of there so it doesn't siphon while it's canning. I want to go right up to the neck but leave the, the head space right on the neck. Um, just so you can see, this jar is pretty hot now. Um, I don't know if that's clear. Right about where my finger is, I've got water up to there, head space after that. And you can see some of the berries are starting to float to the top. Some are sunk. They're going to do that. Um, more would be sunk, like I mentioned earlier, if I didn't have the the slightly dehydrating berries, but I've seen them do that with, with good grapes and everything else um, that I've done juice this way with. And as we get this full, this is one of my very old jars and that funnel doesn't quite want to sit in there, so I'm going to keep an eye on that one, see if it actually seals. If not, it'll be going in the, the fridge to um, faster. Now could you do the same thing without canning them? I believe so. I've never done that but I think you could. It's going to take some amount of time. I would say I've never opened one of these jars of juice uh, before a couple months. Maybe a month would be fine because you need some time for the all the good flavor to leach out of those berries into the water. But if I was going to try this without canning it, if I just wanted to do you know a jar or two, I'd probably pour boiling water over it just like this then just let it sit on the counter for, I don't know, the next 12 hours or something while that water cooled the whole way down. And then just put it in the back of the fridge and probably wait at least three or four weeks and pull it out and see if the, uh, the water now seems to be flavored like juice. Because as you can see in these right now, you can probably see it looks like clear water with dark berries in there. When they come out of the canner, already it's going to not look like that. It's going to be starting to look purpley pink, um, the water is, and it's going to get more that way the longer it sits. So in just a minute, and over here in the background I've got both canners heating up. Again, I, I'll try to remember to link to those canners down below. Um, if I forget, amazon.com slash shop slash fineth. 
and look under kitchen stuff. I know I've got a link there. These are an older model. One of these was one of my mother's spare ones and one I had found at the garage sale. And um, I have one newer one as well that I'm not running right now, but I might get, um, you know, go in here after I get a few more of these jars filled up, depending how many I have here. I have three steam canners. Once again, steam canners, and you can go back and look at some of my other videos about some of the basics of canning and such. Um, can be used interchangeably, basically, with water bath canners. The main difference being I've got a small volume of water there to heat up and heave around instead of clear full, and I just like that better. Uh, it took the USDA quite a while to approve them. I've been using them for more than three decades. I know people have been doing it longer. Um, they were not very popular in the area where I grew up in Pennsylvania, but actually where I live now, where there's quite a few LDS folks, um, they have been using them for a long time as well and doing a lot of canning and preserving. So this isn't a new thing, but I am, just to be clear, showing you what I do. If you want to be 100% sure that you can't possibly screw anything up, um, go check the USDA's guidelines. I don't believe I'm doing anything in this particular day that doesn't follow their guidelines. Not that I never would. Um, but anyway, you can go and check that stuff out if you're concerned. But I do have several other videos on canning all kinds of other things. Pickled carrots, sweet pickles, dill pickles, peaches, spaghetti sauce, uh, choke cherry juice, I forget what all. Anyway, um, I did one just on some of the basics of canning questions. So if you're curious, you can check out that video. Now when I go to put lids on here, this is the important thing if you want something to keep. You want it to seal. So this is hot water. It's just cooled down enough I can touch it. This is not as big a deal with something like a whole berry. It'd be fairly obvious if a whole berry was sitting there on the rim of a, a jar. But I, I take that hot water and I go around the rim. I'm doing several things. I'm wiping off any dirt that could have got on there. Plus I've got my lids soaking in that water just so that rubber seal has kind of warmed up. It helps it seal a little better. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'm making sure there's no particles of stuff in the way on the rim there. I'm also feeling to be sure I don't feel any little chips or cracks because uh, that can happen over, <coughs> over time as jars get moved around. Um, if I have a chip one, I'll, it'll go to being used to put dried herbs or something. I'm not sealing in it. I'm not going to throw it away, but I'm not going to use it for something where I'm actually canning like this. And. I said I was going to lay a little extra water out. I I got a little full. Um, but we want to be sure there's a nice clean seal. The rubber is nice and warm. Apparently, I can't count. I thought I had 14 lids soaking. Um, and just that there's nothing that's going to interfere with a, a nice snug seal. Now I'm going to put the rings on. These jars are hot to the touch. There, you could use a pot holder or something. Um, and I just tighten them what feels good and, and firm to me, not really cranked down. I don't need to put the clay muscles or anything onto this. Um, the ring is basically just holding that lid securely in place until it seals. And that's all it needs to be doing. If you over tighten those, I think sometimes some of the steam that's trying to vent as the jar heats can't escape and that can lead to getting buckled lids is what I hear. I've never actually had that happen, but I have heard of, of people having that happen. Okay, that's seven of them. They're going to, that water is nice and warm. Uh, when you're opening something with steam, open it away from yourself. You can give yourself a serious steam burn if you tip it towards yourself, for sure. So hot water in there. I've got hot jars going in with hot water inside of them. And this is the main key to not breaking jars. And still sometimes one will break. It happens every now and then, but um, sometimes I think that's just a jar that's gotten really weak over time or banged too many times or something. But in general, if you keep everything hot, I'm putting that lid back down on there. Um, we're going to start the timer when we see steam coming out of both those holes. Generally, if everything's hot, you don't get any of those shocks from hot to cold, not from your jar to your work surface, your table, not from your hot water to a cold jar, not from a cold jar to a hot canner, and so on. If you don't have any of those big temperature differences, um, it's, you're, you're going to very rarely have a broken jar. 
which is a good thing. So, get the next seven going here. Let's see if I can run these counters at the same time. I'm gonna give you a close up here. Here's a nice old ball jar. I don't know if you can see the writing on there, but see how clear the, the water looks inside there? The berries floating up and down. Here in a minute, we're gonna see how different that looks after being in the canner. For the second one, once again, I'm taking the lid off away from me to not dump the steam on my face and arms. You can see we've got hot water in there, hot jars going in here. If I set a cold jar onto that hot metal with, with hot water, it's a good chance it would shatter the second I set it onto there. So that's the main key, I think. Keep everything hot, hot, hot. I'm going to fit seven quarts in here, just like that. Put the lid back on, so this whole top part is going to fill with steam. And right here you can see a vent hole. Um, when, I, when the steam fills up to the top and fills back down, that's when the whole thing, the steam will be as hot, if not hotter than the boiling water. The whole thing will be hot through. When it starts steaming out those side holes, that's when I'm going to start the timer. For uh, berry juice here, I'm going to do it for 10 minutes and then we'll show pulling it out. 10 minutes starting after the steam starts. Okay, killing the heat to both of these. Our timer just rang. Once again, open steam away from yourself, not towards yourself. Look at how dark that berry juice already looks, or the, the water in there, instead of being clear. Some place they can be hot. Now, you don't have to wait like you do with a, a pressure canner to take these off, but once again, I don't want any temperature shock going from, you know, the boiling water in there is about 197 degrees here, not 212 because of the elevation we're at, but I don't want to go from boiling water to anything cold. Fortunately for that, it's like 100 degrees here in the shade right now in the lean to, so. That's not too big a problem, but as you can probably see, I have an old towel on my wood here. Um, thrift stores are great places to find old towels for often a buck or 50 cents or something. And old towels are great to have for canning. So we are going to take all these off and set them here real careful. And I've already got the next 14 jars ready to go in. So we're going to do a, a switch. And then we will have 28 quarts of service berry juice for the cost of Clay and I's time to pick the berries and um, the uh, couple tablespoons of sugar total I use. Now I'm seeing on here, I don't know if you guys can see that whitishness around the bottom of the jar. That is from the hard water. If you don't want that to happen, put a little bit of vinegar into your uh, water in the bottom of the canner. It doesn't hurt anything other than just not looking very nice. Um, we do have very hard water here, but uh, I don't usually bother with that. But if it bothers you, a little vinegar in the bottom of your canner will fix that. So this one still looks plenty full. That one evaporated down a little more. some more of my spare hot water I had boiled so it's not completely hot anymore but it's not completely cold so I'm just going to top that off again before I start the next round so I kind of want it level with the, the top of this grate that they're sitting on and now our next 14 jars that we've got ready just like the first ones going in here again hot water hot jars all of that good stuff. Put this lid back on there. Hot water and hot jars here. And if you want to do a smaller batch and you say you didn't have seven full jars, I would try to spread them out evenly. Like if I had five, I would 
I'm just gonna have to hold that way. Put them in my canner, you know, something like that. Or if I had four, I'd go like that. Um, you just wanna kinda keep it balanced. I have almost always run full canners in my life. Growing up in a household with nine people, we canned a lot of our own stuff. It was rare that you had an empty one. And back to burner up. Once again, as soon as the steam starts, we're going to start the timer for that again. And here's our jars that just came out. Look at how deep and rich purple that juice already looks. It's pretty incredible. Here in this jar you can still see bubbles coming up to the top. Uh, actually I'm seeing that in the tops of several jars. I don't know if the camera's picking it up where I can see bubbles coming up. And if the light's catching it just right you can see how each lid is still domed up that uh, they will seal sometime in the next 24 hours unless one of the seals fails but that will suck down and become concave instead. And that's when you hear that satisfying little pop that tells you everything is good. But we're going to let them sit there without moving for at least 24 hours. But it's still satisfying for me to see how rich that looks already. So it's the next morning. This is about probably 16 hours after we canned. And when I push gently in the center of each of these lids, I'm getting no flex. They have all sealed. So I've got 28 quarts of service berry juice here, looking beautiful. And I'm going to actually remove the rings now, because remember all these rings we're doing was holding that lid in place till it's sealed. And then these aren't too bad. Sometimes the outsides of the jars are a little sticky. If they are, I'll wipe them down and then they're going in on the pantry shelf. But that is our finished berry juice product. So I just unscrew the rings, which I will then wash and put away or reuse for other canning. Um, this keeps the rings from rusting. It helps them last a lot longer and prevents any possibility of if a jar should unseal on the shelf. I've never had this happen, but it could. If a jar should unseal on the shelf and you still have a tight ring on it, it could reseal um, with a temperature change or something before you went to open, you wouldn't realize it had spoiled possibly, though you'd probably smell that it was bad. Anyway, so that's why I don't leave the rings on. And then I just very gently, you don't want to pry on that lid at all, wipe any stickiness or anything off the jar before I put them on the shelf. And that's that. Almost 30 quarts of berry juice going into the pantry, which is always exciting. We hope you enjoyed it. Come back next time for more adventures. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.